invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I am Joseph Tay from the University of Ghana, and I am happy to be invited here to moderate this session, which is very important to us. I have been working with the IOM for some number of years, maybe as a partner in the area of migration policy development in West Africa. I've also been part of the team that has been involved in training and capacity building in the West African sub-region. And so I wish to thank them once again that they have invited me here to moderate this section. The topic for today is partnership frameworks for developing capacity on migration, a regional perspective. I hope you agree with me that this regional perspective is important. The Global Compact actually emphasizes both global level partnerships, but it also emphasizes partnerships at the regional level and also at the national level. The reason why the regional level one is important is the fact that most of the migrations that we are talking about are things that occur at the national level, the local level, and also the regional level. We do know that in many regions of the world, about 70% of the migrations are said to be intra-regional. So if we are talking about capacity building at the global level and it does not trickle down to the regional level, we are not likely to achieve success. So this topic is very, very important to all of us. We have three questions that are going to guide the discussion for the day. And I want to read these questions as they have been put forward by the organizers. So the first question is how can we use the existing global partnership framework as an inspiration to develop capacity on migration at the regional level? So here we are talking about drawing on the frameworks that are developed at the global level to work at the regional level. So the global level partnership agreements have to help us to domesticate other levels other development of, of capacity at the regional level, and that is very important. The second one is what role do regional bodies and mechanisms have in empowering member states and other relevant actors on migration? And the final one is that has a premise that states that non-state actors have a crucial role in developing capacity in the field of migration. What kind of good practices can we observe in the creating of partnership between these actors and UN agencies, states, and other stakeholders? What are the biggest existing challenges to the involvement of non-state actors? With me to do this discussion are five important personalities who are knowledgeable in the field. And I'll give each of them about seven minutes to make their presentations. After this, we will invite you, because we do know that you are also very knowledgeable in the field, to share your experiences. So the first person that will be speaking to us on this topic is Mr. Thomas Bosek. And he is an ambassador. And he's also, he, uh, Mr. Ambassador Thomas Bosek is a special representative on the migration and refugees of the Council of Europe. One of his priorities is to improve uh, the situation of the high number of refugees and children in the European Union. So he's going to share with us his views about the action plan that they have developed within the Council of Europe to govern the migration and also livelihood issues of refugees and also children. So we now invite you to the floor to share your views with us, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, allow me first to express my gratitude to IOM for the invitation to speak to you today on this most topical uh, issue. Coming from the Council of Europe, an intergovernmental organization founded in the aftermath of the Second World War to uphold uh, democracy, human rights, and rule of law, uh, uh, which is currently uh, encompassing 47 member states uh, and uh, with some 800 million citizens, I think you will not be surprised that I, I approach uh, this theme towards effective migration governance from this particular 
perspective, from the perspective of human rights and, and the rule of law. In the Council of Europe, we believe that sustainable governance only, can only be effective if it is founded on the principles of human rights and rule of law. And a migration governance is no different. So a sustainable, credible, feasible migration governance and any ma management strategy must therefore have human rights protection at its heart. Now, is there a need for capacity building in this area? Is there a need for partnership? Definitely yes. Although the capacity which we must build upon already exists. Over the past 70 years, the Council of Europe has developed extensive expertise in standard setting, most notably through the European Convention on Human Rights, but also through many other conventions and guidelines also in the field of migration. A network of monitoring bodies supervises their implementation. Via these bodies and other cooperation activities, we support uh, the member states to ensure that the human rights and of all those who, are, who come within their jurisdiction, including migrants, are protected. So as I said, we have quite developed capacity as far as the rules and standards are concerned. What we need now is to develop implementation capacity for the existing human rights standards and for the respect of existing rules. And this is the real task we have to face. And this is also the contribution we want to make to the process lead leading towards effective migration governance. So building implementation capacity. Of course, it's not a it's not and it will not be a very, uh, it's, it is and it will be a very challenging task, especially now when there has been a shift in public opinion and we have also seen in Europe a hardening of states' attitudes towards migrants when security approach prevails. A number of legislative proposals and concrete actions are against the commitment of states to our values and discharge their obligations under the European Convention on Human Rights to uphold our human rights standards and work towards the effect effective implementation is challenging, but it's not impossible. And let me give you one example of successful capacity building to help states overcome the difficulties to implement human rights standards. One extremely important aspect of my work as a special representative on migration and refugees is the appalling situation of the high number of refugee and migrant children currently present in Europe. I conducted numerous fact-finding missions in countries touched by migration, so-called, touched by so-called migration crisis, and saw for myself the situation on the ground. And in order to improve the protection of these children, our 47 member states agreed on an action plan on protecting refugee and migrant children, which is now being implemented mm -hmm. and which serves as the framework for the Council of Europe activities in this area. And the initiatives undertaken in implementation of the action plan represent some of the most ambitious and successful actions of our organization in the migration field. They, in particular, can offer a valuable contribution to our member states, but also other regions and the international community as a whole, seeking to secure the practical implementation of the laudable objectives of the, in the Global Compact on Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration. We have already achieved tangible progress under the action plan. Guidance on alternatives to immigration detention of children. European qualification passport for refugees. Identification of children who are victims of child trafficking. Or a, a training course on refugee and migrant children for professionals working with children. Just to mention a few results. New guidelines regarding effective guardianship and a handbook on promoting child-friendly information for young migrants are also underway. As I have uh, referred to before, this is a challenging time for countries across the world. And we therefore cannot compromise on our values and the principles we stand for. On the contrary, now more than ever, we, international and regional organizations, must unite our forces to achieve our common goals, building on the expertise and added value we each have. One thing connects us all, the shared principle of human rights protection, because it's not a continent-specific idea, but a universal one. The principle that human rights and the rule of law are integral parts of any migration management policy was also a guiding element in our contribution to the preparation of the Global Compact, and subsequently, 
it will continue to be our guiding principle throughout its implementation. The Council of Europe is uniquely placed to share experience on how to progress in practice. Our system for human rights protection is one of the most developed in the world. And for many years now, we have worked on putting in place a range of standards and tools which helps to develop the capacity of our member states to meet the challenges of migration. I have already mentioned the European Convention on Human Rights, respect for which is overseen by the European Court of Human Rights. And through the court judgments, standards on detention for migration purposes, accommodation and minimum social rights for migrants and protection of migrant children have been elaborated. Training courses and cooperation activities have been developed to help member states implement these standards. A number of other conventions, many of which are open to signature by non-European states, contribute to capacity development in the migration-related areas, such as prevention of torture, prevention of violence against women and domestic violence, protection of children against sexual exploitation and sexual abuse, and trafficking in human beings. Monitoring bodies conduct regular visits to identify areas where more support is needed and the Council of Europe engages in follow-up work to enhance the capacity of states to address areas of challenge. Being a pan-European organization, our legal space stretches from Vladivostok to Lisbon, from Reykjavik to Nicosia, but even further. We are also providing a framework for effective partnership. Via its neighborhood policy, the Council of Europe is cooperating with countries of North Africa, the Middle East and Central Asia with a view to, to establishing a common legal area based on the Council of Europe's values and instruments. And the aim of the Council of Europe's policy towards neighboring regions is to facilitate democratic political transition and promote good governance in the beneficiary countries while reinforcing and expanding the Council of Europe's regional action in combating cross-border challenges such as migration. We stand therefore ready to exchange our experiences with partners outside the European legal space. Migration-related challenges are not decreasing, and I am certain that it is only by working together effectively on capacity development that we can address today's challenges and build a fair and sustainable model for the future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Thomas Bosek, for the excellent presentation on the situation in Europe. We now invite the second person, and that is Dr. Gudiria Rangel Gomez, a few information on her. So she is the executive secretary, executive secretarial to the Mexico section, Mexico U.S. Health Border Commission, International Relations General Division to the Health Secretariat of Mexico. Previously, she served as a director of Department of Population Studies and deputy general director for Margaret's Health or the Secretariat of Health of Mexico, among other positions. So she is going to help us to understand capacity building in the area of health and migration. So you are on the floor. Eh, muchas gracias. Eh, un agradecimiento especial a la OIM por invitarme el día de hoy a presentar eh, un poco de la experiencia del gobierno mexicano en la creación de alianzas y compartir eh, algunos ejemplos de buenas prácticas en el tema de salud y migración. Eh, voy a empezar con una estrategia que le llamamos Ventanillas de Salud. Eh, esta estrategia es una colaboración entre dos secretarías de Estado del gobierno mexicano, la Secretaría de Relaciones Exteriores y la Secretaría de Salud de México, eh, en el que a través de toda su red consular este, de México en Estados Unidos operan 50 ventanillas de salud. Eh, ¿Qué son las ventanillas de salud? Las ventanillas de salud es una iniciativa que... Eh, tiene el objetivo de mejorar el acceso a servicios básicos y preventivos de salud, aumentar la cobertura de los seguros públicos y establecer un hogar médico a través de información, educación, asesoría y referencia 
a servicios de salud para atención más especializada. ¿Cómo operan estas ventanillas de salud? Pues operan a través de 50 agencias de Estados Unidos quienes trabajan coordinadamente con el gobierno mexicano para brindar estos servicios eh, preventivos a la población eh, migrante, no solamente mexicana, a población latina viviendo en Estados Unidos, porque también atendemos y se brindan estos servicios a eh, otros este, países. Eh, tenemos eh, con este programa también eh, todo un banco de datos de más de seis años en donde podemos y ustedes pueden consultar la población atendida, los servicios que se brindan. Eh, principalmente nos enfocamos en orientación y consejería, en detección oportuna de aquellos padecimientos que más afectan a nuestra población latina viviendo en Estados Unidos. Se trabaja principalmente con enfermedades crónico-degenerativas, que es sobrepeso, obesidad y diabetes, enfermedades eh, transmisibles como VIH y tuberculosis. Eh, se ofrecen eh, servicios de orientación en el tema de salud mental. Eh, también se administran vacunas, entre otros y hacemos la referencia oportuna. La detección eh, para el gobierno mexicano es muy importante porque con esto contribuimos que nuestros connacionales viviendo en Estados Unidos eh, disminuyan el número de visitas a una sala de emergencia. Eh, hemos tenido este, logros y creo que el logro como buena práctica este, eh, ha sido esta capacidad del gobierno de México en coordinar por 15 años una estrategia en la que cada vez más se suman aliados estratégicos. Además de estas 50 agencias que operan estas ventanillas de salud, eh, contamos con alrededor de 600 agencias de los diferentes sectores de la población en Estados Unidos, la academia, organizaciones internacionales, nacionales y estatales que contribuyen a el brindar estos servicios preventivos a la población latina. Eh, también contamos con resultados detallados del impacto de las ventanillas de salud, el fortalecimiento de, de alianzas de carácter nacional ha sido muy importante y la generación de evidencia. Eh, otra de las iniciativas es en el retorno de nuestros connacionales de Estados Unidos a México. En la frontera norte, en los seis estados, tenemos eh, los módulos de atención integral a la salud del migrante repatriado, cuyo objetivo también es la protección de la salud del migrante. En el momento que están retornando, el eh, personal de salud les está ofreciendo servicios preventivos y en caso necesario poderlos referir a una institución de salud para recibir la atención médica requerida. En el tema de nuestros migrantes repatriados es eh, importante, así como en Ventanillas de Salud, este, eh, el poderles brindar asesoría y atención psicológica en situación de crisis en el momento que están siendo repatriados. El tema de salud mental eh, para nosotros es muy importante. Eh, tenemos también como una iniciativa eh, es, fue la Declaración Conjunta de Mesoamérica sobre Salud y Migración. Eh, esta declaración se firmó el 25 de abril del 2017 y de ahí se desprende eh, algunos acuerdos, como el intercambiar buenas prácticas entre los países de Mesoamérica, identificar áreas de oportunidad para mejorar la salud de las personas migrantes y establecer mecanismos de cooperación multilateral. Eh, otra de las iniciativas y que ha sido coordinada este, desde su inicio, hace tres años aproximadamente, es la Iniciativa Conjunta de Salud y Migración. 
Y en esta iniciativa conjunta, eh, nosotros le llamamos que es eh, un mecanismo de coordinación técnica regional con tres grandes objetivos. Una eh, que provea información estratégica, la conformación de alianzas y la promoción de políticas inclusivas. En esta iniciativa eh, está conformada y, y se integró para este, trabajar los países de Centroamérica y México y eh, cuenta con un comité directivo de los diferentes sectores de la población. Participa el gobierno de los gobiernos de los diferentes países, participa la academia, el sector privado y las organizaciones de la sociedad civil. Eh, como parte eh, de esta eh, iniciativa, eh, yo podría decirles también como un ejemplo concreto de la contribución de este tipo de alianzas, así como eh, lo comenté con Ventanillas de Salud, eh, trabajamos en una propuesta de inclusión explícita del tema de salud para el Pacto Mundial de Migración y se las hicimos llegar a los países para que ellos este, pudieran decidir si consideraban este, proponerla para su inclusión. Eh, otro ejemplo es la conferencia regional eh, sobre migración, que no me voy a detener porque ya se habló este, este día por la mañana de ello, pero en donde eh, a través de la conferencia regional de migración como resultados pues tenemos el intercambio de información, la capacitación, entre otros. Eh, para no eh, detenerme mucho, yo quisiera eh, resumir eh, la presentación, eh, terminando pues diciéndoles que para tener un mayor impacto en el acceso a servicios de salud de la población migrante, es importante impulsar el fomento de capacidades en materia de salud y migración, principalmente eh, en el caso específico de la salud a los prestadores de servicios de salud. Que este fortalecimiento de capacidades incluya la sensibilización de estos prestadores para proveer eh, los servicios que nuestra población migrante requiere. Crear y fortalecer alianzas. Eh, yo, en la experiencia que tengo desde la academia y ahora como este, eh, trabajadora de la salud en el gobierno federal, les digo que ha sido muy grato ver esta estrategia de ventanillas de salud con más de 600 alianzas que están apoyando este programa. Sin el apoyo de los aliados estratégicos, la Secretaría de Salud y la Secretaría de Relaciones Exteriores en Estados Unidos no podrían haber tenido un impacto como el que se tiene ahorita. Eh, compartir buenas prácticas, también se dijo este, en eh, otras presentaciones el día de hoy. No tenemos que inventar. Creo que las buenas prácticas en intercambio de información, en proveer servicios en la creación de alianzas y el fomento de las capacidades pueden replicarse, adecuarse a las necesidades de cada país o de cada región. La recopilación y análisis de la información es necesaria y creo que también eso podemos este, compartirlo. En este sentido, pues yo eh, terminaría diciéndoles que eh, es muy importante que en los foros de migración se incluya el tema de la salud, el tema de la salud de nuestra población migrante, ya que sin salud nadie de nosotros somos funcionales. Y tener siempre presente que la salud es un derecho y nuestra población migrante, por lo tanto, debe tener el acceso a la salud. Muchísimas gracias. So thank you, Gudiria, for that wonderful presentation on capacity building in the area of health. Her presentation actually highlighted the need for partnership if we want to extend health services to migrants. So now we move on to the third presentation, and that is from Mr. Dugatio Tudotu.
And he is going to give us an African perspective for the capacity building issues. So by way of uh, introduction, he is the Foreign Service Officer in the Directorate of Multilateral Cooperation of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Tanzania. He works with in the international development partners in resource mobilization and facilitation of international trade and investment. Prior to taking up this role, he worked in other two directories within the ministry and various positions in the private sector. So he will give us an African perspective of the capacity building in the area of migration governance. You are on the floor. Thank you, moderator. Um, uh, I wish to express my appreciation to the International Organization for Migration for giving me an opportunity to take part in this discussion. It is indeed a privilege that I take with esteem to have been part of this process towards the adoption of the Global Compact for Migration. Also, let me congratulate and add on my voice to the previous speakers since morning to the uh, well-deserved election of Mr. Vittorino to the seat of Director General to the IOM. While congratulating him, we also heed on the expectation that he will continue to adopt to the realities of our time and be flexible in responding to the possible future migration challenges. Before we I think before we go to, into the discussion on the comprehensive uh, uh, agenda on migration management, I would first encourage fellow participants to reflect on the actual situation on the, on the ground and engage in a candid self-discussion with a view of tailoring realistic responses to migration issues, while at the same time focusing on the perpetrators of irregular migration, which are mostly engineered by organized crime. Organized crime is evolving in the face of our actions and have made a commodity out of migration and documentation processes. The very concept of home has increasingly become elusive and even acquires a new meaning. As never before, more people are now likely to move from one place to the other for different reasons, signaling an age of seamless societies. We should be concerned of the worries of the host communities who feel threatened and losing out to the migrants. And sometimes <coughs> this worry even excites xenophobic tendencies in some places. Also, gender equality and empowerment of women are also important issues to be addressed critically while embarking on discussion to deal with migration management. In the same vein, showing respect to migrants, engage in cooperative to end violence for forced migration, and double the international efforts to finding durable solutions for economic migrants should be more pronounced in these discussions. Let us not demonize the migrants, and our discourse in African and European perspectives should be harmonized in order to get to the common understanding of the issues so that we can come out with the realistic solutions. My colleagues, the, the previous speaker, has spoken of human rights as a guiding principle in the management of migration issues. I think it's an important uh, factor to be considered in. As migration issues are increasingly becoming complex and challenging, cooperative efforts with the national government at regional level and, global, and globally is key to ensure effective management of migration-related aspects at, at both the country of original and destination. Recognizant of that, some of, of the same prompted the international community to engage in discussions like this so that we can, we're having today so that we can tailor the best responses towards migration management. The African Union uh, also adopted a migration, migration policy framework in the view to exploring innovative ways 
of effective addressing migration-related issues and harness the benefit that comes with it. That framework is designed to guide individual member countries on the elements to be included in the national migration policies and development. Such issues to be considered include border management, forced displacement, interstate cooperation and partnership, and migration data collection, dissemination, and use. Also, the framework, coupled with the quest to comply with the international standards on migration management, provides an opportunity for international cooperation on capacity building and technical support. On East Africa, the charter that established the, the current East African cooperation provides for free movement of people and puts on a mechanism for management of migration flow. However, the limited capacity of member states to develop comprehensive migration management programs have slowed progress towards achieving the desirable results. In South Africa, Southern Africa, the Southern African Development Corporation doesn't have a migration policy framework, but individual member countries follow their own laws on migration management and there is a protocol on facilitation of movement of persons in the region. This protocol is um, also supported by the ACBC of the IOM. Tanzania, where I come from, has signed several bilateral agreements with the neighboring countries such as Mozambique, Malawi, and Zambia on migration management related issues. The cooperation agreements are on sharing information and experience related to transnational organized crime, such as trafficking in persons, smuggling of migrants, counterfeit traveling documents, and capacity building on conducting investigations to these crimes. The non-state uh, non actors like IOM and UNHCR have also played a significant role in training government officials to assist the national authorities effectively manage migration and its related impact in communities. The IOM African Capacity Building Center that is located in Tanzania has helped a great deal in promoting migration management in the region for almost a decade now. Uh, the center facilitates a diverse range of migration management training programs and encourages capacity uh, on national authorities on integrated border management, security, as well as mi migration administration. Currently, the ACBC Center is assisting more than 20 member, member states in Africa. It also provides advice on free movement protocol arrangements with the regional uh, groupings. On top of that, it's also assisting individual states to develop their migration management capacities. The ongoing partnership and support from the IOM African Capacity Building Center in Africa is very commendable. Also, in, th in this room and the rest of the world, as we await to adopt the Global Compact for Migration that call on states to strengthen capacity on a more effective system on global migration governance, the international community is called on into action to join the efforts and live on to their commitments to support, especially the developing countries in management of migration related issues. We all desire for an innovative way of global migration governance, which is more likely than not to be more possible by effective international cooperation. Migration governance needs strengthened partnership, coordination support, assessment tools and financing. However, if the international community and development agencies do not live to their commitment in the management of migration programs, literal can be achieved. Let this process double the international cooperation to avoid the past weaknesses and dress up to address the current and anticipative future migration challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Doto, for your presentation, which has highlighted the role of IOM 
and other international bodies in Africa as far as capacity building is concerned. We now move on to the next presenter, and that is Mr. Dries Okemini, who is a member of the Arab Parliament for the House of Representatives of Morocco and a member of the Commission for the Production Sectors. He is also a member of the Parliamentary Network on the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, and serves as a professor at the University of Mohammed Rabat in Morocco. He will contribute the Arab Parliament's vision on the topic of capacity development and governance on migration. You are on the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Moderateur. Mes remerciements vont également à l'OIM pour avoir invité le Parlement arabe à ce dialogue international sur la migration. Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, tout d'abord, permettez-moi de vous transmettre les salutations du Président du Parlement arabe et par là même son souhait pour que le, doigt, le dialogue ici entamé aboutisse à des, des résultats satisfaisants. Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, le Parlement arabe, qui représente pratiquement tous les euh, parlements de les, de, des nations arabes et qui travaille sous l'égide de la Ligue des nations arabes, accorde une, une attention de grande importance à ces questions de migration, d'asile et de déplacement des personnes, en association avec les droits de l'homme. Cette question a, a suscité de nombreux débats politiques, sociaux et économiques, que ce soit au niveau national, régional et international, vu que depuis des années, le nombre de migrants légaux et illégaux, de personnes déplacées et de personnes qui fuient des conflits, ne cessent d'augmenter. Le monde arabe est de plus en plus préoccupé par ce problème qui ne cesse de s'aggraver. Il en est l'une des régions les plus touchées. Et par conséquent, le Parlement arabe en fait l'une de ses priorités tout en cherchant de s'attaquer à ces causes profondes et de leur trouver des solutions adéquates. Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, certes, pas un seul gouvernement, pas une seule organisation nationale, pas ou internationale, pas une seule partie prenante ne peuvent à eux seuls relever les défis d'apporter des solutions à ces problèmes. Donc, des efforts conjoints de la part de tous et de tous les intervenants, qu'ils soient nationaux, régionaux, internationaux, sont donc nécessaires pour pouvoir pallier à ce fléau. Et dans le but d'adopter sa contribution à ce sujet, le, port, le Parlement arabe agit selon deux axes. Le premier axe, il s'agit des outils permettant de remédier aux causes profondes de la crise. Ainsi, le Parlement arabe ne cesse de faire usage de ses attributions pour s'attaquer aux causes réelles de ce fléau et chercher des solutions pacifiques aux sources de tensions et conflits dans le but de faire avancer et de progresser les éléments suivants. Tout d'abord, demander à la communauté internationale, à la conscience mondiale vivante, de mettre fin à la souffrance du peuple palestinien. Mesdames et Messieurs, comme vous savez qu'un homme ou un État sans patrie est condamné à une mort lente, à une, finalement à une disparition, il est donc temps de, déca, de déclarer l'État de Palestine comme euh, l'État de Palestine et comme sa capitale Jérusalem. De Jérusalem. À ce propos, le, le Parlement arabe réaffirme encore son rejet à la décision de l'administration américaine d'avoir reconnu Jérusalem comme capitale à la puissance occupante Israël et le, tra le transfert de son ambassade. Nous soulignons aussi la nécessité de préserver la continuité de la mission de nos rois et le lien permanent entre la fin de ces travaux et la résolution 194. Deuxièmement, ou le deuxième point sur lequel le euh, Parlement arabe travaille, c'est de soutenir toutes les initiatives politiques visant à régler la, la situation et à mettre fin au conflit dans la région du monde arabe. Le troisième point, c'est d'accélérer l'achèvement de l'examen, premièrement de la, de la Convention arabe contre le terrorisme, et, secondo, la Convention arabe contre le blanchiment de capitaux et le financement du terrorisme. Le quatrième point dans euh, cet axe-là, c'est de continuer à soutenir la, la résolution de la crise syrienne au moyen d'un processus politique global 
qui répond aux aspirations du peuple syrien quant au choix du gouvernement et réaffirmer l'unité, l'arabisme, l'indépendance, l'intégrité territoriale et le caractère non sectaire de la Syrie et assurer la continuité et la préservation des institutions gouvernementales, protéger les droits de tous les Syriens sans distinction aucune. Cinquièmement, apporter appui et assistance aux efforts déployés par la, la République de, de l'Irak afin de permettre aux personnes déplacées de retourner chez, eux, chez elles et de promouvoir l'unité nationale. Sixièmement, apporter appui et, assist, et assistance à la poursuite des efforts des Nations Unies et des, des pays arabes en, fut, en vue d'un règlement politique basé sur les trois références, l'initiative du CCG et son mécanisme exécutif, les résultats de la conférence et le dialogue national global et, et, et les solutions du Conseil de sécurité, en particulier la, la résolution 2216 et à éviter toute action qui menace les pays voisins. Septièmement, soutenir les efforts arabes et internationaux vis, visant à aider le gouvernement somalien dans ses projets de développement urgents. Dans le deuxième axe, dans le, deuxième axe le euh, Parlement arabe travaille sur les outils permettant de traiter les conséquences et les effets de la migration et du déplacement. Cet axe concerne les conséquences et les effets de la migration, de l'asile et du déplacement des populations du monde arabe qui, font, qui, qui, font fuir, qui, qui fuient les zones de, de, de conflit et de tension. Et à cet égard, ce qui, ce qui est ré, ré, réalisable est le suivant. Tout d'abord... Il faut accélérer la finalisation, nous sommes en train d'accélérer la finalisation de la révision de la Convention arabe sur la réglementation du statut des réfugiés dans les États arabes, qui a été examinée par le Parlement arabe et soumise au Conseil ministériel des pays arabes. Deuxièmement, travailler ensemble avec les parlements régionaux similaires, notamment le, parla le Parlement panafricain, le Parlement européen, l'Assemblée parlementaire asiatique, le Parlement de l'Amérique latine, l'Assemblée parlementaire de l'Union pour la Méditerranée, le Parlement euro-méditerranéen, le, les parlements des pays arabes, les parlements des pays amis, et afin d'inciter tous les gouvernements respectifs de leur pays à faire face aux problèmes des réfugiés et de s'acquitter de leurs obligations envers les réfugiés, protéger leurs droits conformément aux cadres juridiques internationaux et régionaux et d'empêcher leur exploitation économique ou politique. Troisièmement, réaffirmer la, la responsabilité des organisations internationales, y compris l'union interparlementaire, de, promou de promouvoir le respect des droits des réfugiés, de maintenir et protéger leur statut juridique conformément aux droits interna internationaux humanitaires et aux droits internationaux des réfugiés. Quatrièmement, collaborer avec les organi organisations humanitaires arabes et internationales afin d'assurer aux réfugiés et aux personnes déplacées leurs droits, y compris la protection des enfants, la protection de la femme et la protection des malades et des personnes âgées. Cinquièmement, œuvrer pour garantir l'acheminement des secours dans le cas de, 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 des urgences, en fournissant une variété de produits de première nécessité, tels que la nourriture, l'abri, l'aide médicale, ne, et surtout ne pas séparer les enfants de leur famille et veiller au regroupement familial. Sixièmement, appeler les pays arabes et les Nations, et les nations unies, unies à apporter des solutions nécessaires aux pays hôtes qui accueillent un grand nombre de réfugiés et d'accroître l'aide financière et l'aide en nature à tous les pays qui se conforment aux dispositions des conventions internationales et des règles du, du droit international en accueillant les personnes déplacées et les réfugiés et à exhorter tous les autres pays à partager le fardeau plus équitablement avec le pays d'accueil et les communautés les plus touchées. Septièmement, promouvoir les formes nouvelles, des formes nouvelles et novatrices de financement pour les pays d'accueil des réfugiés en appelant à ouvrir les possibilités de développement et exhorter le secteur privé et les hommes d'affaires arabes à orienter des investissements vers ces pays, à établir les taux d'emploi spécifiques pour les réfugiés afin de, afin de permettre à leurs compétences de les protéger, ainsi que leur communauté conformément aux règles juridiques et sans exploiter leur situation. Huitièmement, soutenir tous les efforts de secours humanitaire de toutes les organisations humanitaires internationales et appeler toutes les parties au conflit à respecter les règles de disposition de droit international humanitaire pour la protection des agents humanitaires, de même appeler les gouvernements à permettre aux organisations et associations humanitaires travaillant sur le, ter le terrain 
de fournir l'assistance et toute forme d'aide humanitaire aux réfugiés et aux personnes déplacées. Neuvièmement, adopter des projets humanitaires conjoints avec les parlements nationaux et les organisations arabes en faveur des communautés affectées sur les lieux de résidence conformément au droit international. Dixièmement, promouvoir la protection juridique et le soutien des civils et les accompagner, et les accompagner pour leur permettre d'accéder à l'aide humanitaire qui est un droit légal absolu en vertu du droit international humanitaire. Excellence, mesdames et messieurs, pour terminer, je voudrais exprimer notre espoir au Parlement arabe que ce dialogue international aboutira à des résultats concrets qui serviront de cadre à l'intégration des rôles dans l'ensemble de la communauté internationale. We truly hope that this assembly will be successful in the interest of uh, humanity as a whole. I have now finished. Thank you, moderator. Thank you so much for that presentation. We now take our last presentation, which will come from Miss Linda Ristango. And she is a manager of external affairs at the International Air Transport Association. In her current capacity, she advocates for good policy and constructive engagement towards possible or proposed measures that may affect ITAS member airlines. So she will present on the role of the private airline companies in partnering in the development of capacity that will help to control what we have been calling trafficking or smuggling. So we now give her the floor. So thank you so much for giving me the floor. And first of all, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to contribute to this important discussion and provide the IATA perspective on the partnership frameworks for developing capacity on migration. Today I will speak uh, specifically about the initiatives that IATA uh, is coordinating, uh, mobilizing our members, the airline members, to support the governments and the society to end the misery of human trafficking, that is a migration-related challenge. First of all, we would like to compliment states for coming together in the Global Compact for safely, orderly and regular migration. This important framework fosters international cooperation among all relevant actors and puts in evidence that migration is a multidimensional reality and as such requires a comprehensive approach and a multi-stakeholder partnership. In my presentation today, I would like to show how aviation can actually um, support states in the implementation of the objective number 10 of the Global Compact to prevent and eradicate uh, human trafficking in the context of, of international migration. So, the Global Compact recognizes that migration is a defining feature of our globalized world, connecting societies within and across all regions and making us all countries of origin, transit, and destination. Now, globalization is extremely important for aviation that seeks a world with open borders for people to travel and trade to flourish. Aviation industry calls itself to be the business of freedom that liberates people to live better lives. The vital connectivity that is provided by aviation is a force for good, connecting businesses to markets, uniting families and friends, and facilitating tourism and also cultural exchange. The fact is that the global air transport system can also be misused by criminals to facilitate the trafficking of men, women, and children. We say that beneath the surface of easy access and global connectivity, there is evidence that traffickers are using aircraft to convey victims. 
and we had few um, uh, testimony from uh, from an, uh, from uh, especially from crew uh, from the members of the, the, the crew. Human trafficking is not only highly profitable and not easy to discover, it, but research, recent research, evidence that it actually serves as a cash generator to finance acts of unlawful interference towards civil aviation. Now, in the efforts to identify victims and support governments and law enforcement authorities, um, law enforcement authorities actually and different governments around the world are increasingly looking for customer facing staff through the transport sector, including airlines, to be trained in human trafficking awareness and reporting. Once trained, staff may be asked to be an additional set of eyes and ears to help in the prevention of human trafficking, especially in identifying the victims. Now our position is that while the provision of training on identifying human trafficking indicators is critically important, on its own is not enough. There is else that needs to be done behind. That's why we have launched a multi-layered approach that I'm going to explain to you in the following slides. It is summarized here, but we are, I'm going to through uh, one by one. First of all, we issued a political commitment with the IATA AGM resolution in June 2018, this year. This resolution approved unanimously by more than 290 airlines, denounces human trafficking, and commits the airline industry to join forces in the fight and support state authorities. This includes urging airlines to implement a policy on human trafficking and also to train relevant staff in awareness and reporting, reporting to the state authorities and to the law enforcement agencies. Second, we have set out an awareness campaign that is, uh, that is called Eyes Open Campaign that aims to increase uh, staff and passengers' awareness of the extent and humanitarian consequences of human trafficking through aviation. This includes an animated film, infographics, leaflets, and other resources that can be easily found in the IATA website, are um, available for everyone. Third, we also issued policy guidance and training material for our members. We need airlines to understand what to do in terms of developing policies. Human trafficking is a crime, so, and also to developing internal procedures. We don't need only to report to enforcement agencies, we need also to build track within the, the, the airlines. We also are providing airlines with practical tools, such as virtual training modules. Also, the first module is available on our website and uh, is easily downloaded, uh, can be easily downloaded. This training illustrates common indicators of trafficking that aviation employees may encounter and how to immediately report suspect, suspected trafficking cases to law enforcement. So we tell our airlines how they can report those suspected uh, indicators, uh, those indicators of suspected victims. Four. Of course, our airlines need to understand with law enforcement in each country where reports of suspected trafficking uh, incidents can be made, especially when those are in flight. That's why we reached out to governments and international organizations, such as IOM, the UNODC, the UNOHCHR, the ICAO, the Bali Process, and many others. 
There is also an advocacy element to the IATA work. We think that actually there are no benefits for us and for states if the, the, the help of the airlines is provided and if we train human traffic, uh, if we train our airlines on spotting human trafficking indicators, if our airlines, they don't know to whom they have to report the suspicions. Therefore, uh, working through our world, um, country offices in the world, we have researched the policy in place should air crew uh, have suspicions of trafficking during a flight or before even a victim is uh, boarded. Because we think that actually when a victim is on board, it's already too late. So human trafficking indicators should even be spotted before the victim goes on board. Knowing to who to report, how and when, so to whom, how to report and when, is for our airlines critically important. Sometimes aviation is really the last leg before a victim disappears forever. In our efforts, as you see in these slides, we have engaged with more than 90 governments in the world. Only a few states, two states actually, have reported to having legislation framework and reporting protocol in, in place specifically for airlines. In this scenario, you may understand that without proper legislation framework, reporting suspected victims would only be for us a tick box exercise and we don't want to have a tick box exercise. This is actually what I was mentioning, our different, uh, um, our layered approach, is actually an example of where the private sector can help develop partnership frameworks and support consultative processes on migration issues. In this case, the, the aviation industry holds significant combining power we have demonstrated as well, with connections to corporate bodies, training authorities, governments, and the traveling public, all of whom need to cooperate in order to tackle human trafficking in the skies as well on the ground. At this point, in ending my brief presentation, the message that I wish you to take away is the following. IATA is the business of freedom, and we want to be a model for other industries on how other industries can approach human trafficking. We want to work with governments, other international organizations, regulators, and law enforcement to deliver results in the, in the spirit of increased cooperation, coordination, and exchange. Our initiative wants to be a tool which we are putting in the hands first of our members, then of the authorities and our partners. But we also recognize that there is only so much that the aviation industry can do to help prevent trafficking. The vigilance and professionalism of airlines and aviation staff can save more people from becoming victims of this horrendous crime. For this to happen, we think that there is a need for a comprehensive approach linking policy to processes in the spirit of collaboration with those international actors that can make the compact a reality. And this ends my presentation. Thank you so much. I'm sure you agree with me that our presenters have given us very insightful presentations on various topics that have to do with capacity building. I don't intend to summarize these presentations because we don't have time, and also because they were very straightforward, and I'm sure we all picked some useful things from them. I just want to highlight two or three issues that we set the stage for our discussion. First of all, you agree with me that they talk about the importance of regional level partnerships. So regional level partnerships were talk about, we saw the situation of the Council of Europe. We also saw the, uh, the situation in the African Union. And I also had the situation of ECOWAS. 
So ECOWAS, since 1979, has been implementing what we call the Free Movement Protocol. And this was a regional level agreement. And that has also a component of a development of capacity. But what is the key issue here, which was highlighted by both Mr. Thomas and Dotu, is the fact that most of these partnerships tend to focus on policy formulation, but not on the implementation. So we lack the implementation capacity. So sometimes at the regional level, member states will gather, and then they will try to formulate nice fine-tuning policies, which are very good on paper uh, to govern migration. And when it comes to the implementation of these policies, then you have less commitment and also you have less capacity. So I think that is something that we should be taking off as we ask our questions. How can we enhance capacity development in the area of policy implementation? It shouldn't just be in the area of what uh, Mr. Thomas calls standard setting, where we just develop rules on paper to protect migrants, but we don't implement it. We need to be thinking of how we are going to enhance capacity to implement policy. Then also they also highlighted the importance of working with UN agencies and other international organizations. And this is very, very important. From my own experience, and I've been telling my students this, that most of the capacity building programs that we have in West Africa, for instance, have been coordinated and funded by UN agencies or by the European Union through UN agencies. So in the, within the ECOWAS region, we work extensively with IOM, ICMPD, and ILO to develop training uh, programs for the countries involved. So these partnerships are very important. Not only are we sending capacity downward, but it also offers us a ground for mutual learning. So capacity building cannot go on if we don't collaborate with international organizations. We need political commitment on the part of our governments to do this. So they just don't sign agreements that they will not support. Then lastly, they also talk about partnership with non-state actors. And this is very, very important. So we heard them talk about how they work with non-state actors to extend health services to vulnerable migrants. Also working with even uh, actors in the transportation industry or the airline industry, and that is very, very important. In most regions of the world, the problem is that state agencies hardly work with non-state actors. So civil society groups have a lot to give, but then sometimes in some areas, we have the government state institutions hijacking all the processes of policy implementation, especially when some little money is involved. Non-state actors have complete bitterly, and I get to know this because I work with both government and non-state actors. So I think something we should be building upon is how to partner with non-state actors to implement some of the policies that we have already talked about.